with no further ado, let's get back to the meat of the conversation, um, which is, which leads into the, actually the podcast point of origin. But, you know, let's, let's talk about the genesis of um, Whetstone Magazine. Let's pick up where we left off there. Hello. And um, let's talk about the stories, the kind of stories that you like to tell um, or that you wanted to tell um, with the magazine and now are planning to expand the story in other ways. So let's start there um, to get grounded. Um, so basically for Whetstone, you know, we have a, a overarching editorial ideology and we basically believe deeply and have seen repeatedly in the power of stories and narratives as a means of not just influencing, but shaping and defining societies and how we relate to those societies. So when people say like stories are a form of power, that is true. But what's more true is that story and power are actually interchangeable, right? Like that's how powerful and pervasive stories are in our in our culture. And so the problem with with stories that are that we are told and taught and absorb is that if if you're observing it through this dynamic of power then the folks who are telling those stories are erasing those who are not in power right and and so for us and for me personally my whole um philosophy around food and around this context of origin is a correction of a historical erasure by not just an inclusion, but a reorientation completely in terms of who gets to tell and own these stories. And that's really how we see um, our role in reshaping um, you know, systems and, and means of power. Okay, so you create this beautiful um, you know, archival piece that is Whetstone Magazine. They sell out every copy. It's hard to get um, after it sells out. <laughs> yes, trust me, I've tried. Um, so you created this beautiful thing. So then what made you decide to move into um, the podcast space that is Point of Origin? Well, we, we started, um, just to back up with the formation of the media company, um, you know, Whetstone was originally started um, with the desire to meet people where they are. And so, um, like, for instance, I was not a great student, right? I didn't um, excel in school, but I, I'm a curious person. Um, and so some folks may need that um, absorption through literary means, through visual means, through auditory means. And so we are trying to meet people where they are with the message. Um, and so podcasting has been part of that arc um, for Whetstone, um, I decided to, uh, along with a cohort of our um, collaborators at Whetstone, start a podcast network, um, which we're calling the Whetstone Radio Collective, um, which we're announcing essentially today or right now, if you will. <laughs> um, and it's coming out this fall. We're announcing it by way of a crowdfunding campaign. Um, there is a reason that we've never seen a podcast network um, dedicated to a correction of this historical erasure, because that needs to be done with a lot of care and intention and vision. And care and intention and vision isn't necessarily what drives the way that we um, not just consume media, but the media that is created for us to consume. So right. we need the people's input in being able to create transformative media. So we are, are reaching out to our community, um, inviting them, asking them to, to support this journey of reclamation. Um, and this fall, you will see um, a lot of narrative care and attention that um, we don't think has yet been presented in, in podcasting. And so we're encouraging people to get behind the, the Wet Sound Radio Collective movement. So let's, you know, and 
there's a campaign around this, but you know, I remember a kind of a spicy um, conversation that happened maybe a couple of months ago around um, funding of um, of essentially black owned storytelling. Now, the storytelling includes everyone, but the ownership is black. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was a, there was a conversation that of, of, of this idea of being validated um, mm -hmm. versus, you know, actually having funding and those two things necessarily being they can be very, they don't have to be exclusive. Sometimes this exists and this exists. So I'm wondering first if we could revisit that. Not too spicy, but also to ask, you know, Whetstone, you've managed to do this on your own. You know, I know that you have like a collective of people who work in your sphere and full disclosure, everyone. Um, you know, somebody that works for Whetstone um, has been. Um, helping Black food folks produce um, our recent podcast, our recently launched podcast. I know you have an, a village behind you, but this came from you. You're intimately involved in this process. Like, how how does one do that and survive? <laughs> All right, those are two separate questions. I'm gonna I'm gonna give them separate treatments. Um, you know, there is a well documented. Um, situation that actually derived from Instagram live um, conversation around um, power, around um, access, shall we say, um, through, through a financial means. Um, and I have been, since the first time I started a crowdfunding campaign in 2016, um, to publicly appeal to people to to join me in this, um, I'm gonna call it a movement because we're talking about a movement of power, right? And so part of that movement necessarily includes a transfer of financial resources, right. since that is the underlying barrier to access for us realizing or actualizing our vision, which is an inclusive vision which is not the vision that has currently been served to us. And so my brother Tunde, who I, I deep, Tunde Wei, who I deeply appreciate, who, um, I've, whose work has inspired me greatly. Um, and in a moment of, of real advocacy um, said, without any hesitation, this is a brother who be supported with financial capital. And the response to that, which was a reflexive response, um, at least for me, as the person whose name was being implicated in this conversation, felt flippant. It felt dismissive because the it reflexive, intuitive response was to say, are you sure? Right. Is that a sound investment? I like, mind you, at this point, we were already in our third year of, of operating, which is the third year of me out here being very loud, asking folks for money, both as we are still continue to do. <laughs> right. Um, and, and even with all the, the additional exposure and notoriety. So, so that is a real thing. Um, and so, I'm not really tripping off of that situation at all. Like it, it's totally fine. But what happened is that it, it, it became a way to exemplify a lot of the dismissive reflexive responses that I was getting as a black entrepreneur, even though I was seeing results, not only in the creative side and the team that we were able to build and our ability to execute and match our vision to execution with an absence of resources, like, so all the normal benchmarks for other conventional entrepreneurs, right. you feel me? Like that wasn't that, we, I wasn't being received in that same way. And that felt like a very public way to um, diminish what I felt was true and evident. Um, and so um, 
that's that's that. And then how have I done that? Um, I really don't. I'm not ready to um, talk about really how difficult this journey has been publicly because I'm still moving through that and um, having a show on Netflix makes everyone else feel as though you've arrived. Right. You feel me? And and I'm still trying to um, get grounded in this work and, and then what I started off, what the intention was for me. Um, but I can tell you that it has been a difficult journey that just this morning I was reflecting and meditating on my the day I decided to to leave college as a freshman after one semester on April 4th 2004 my first day in culinary school that energy like this is a nearly 20 year journey for me and I still have dreams you know I'm still trying to start new ventures and and put more people on and so this global diasporic origin reclamation framework is my own kind of religion it's my own form of resistance and reclamation and i think high on the hog was really a powerful example of the ways in which intentionally and lovingly tying our histories and identities um to movements and to movements around progress and justice and just an ins installation of pride you know is very powerful and so that's what we're trying to to facilitate more with um this new network. So what this what this reminds me of is the uh, is the quote. It took years to achieve my overnight success. Um, <laughs> you know, um, and and that's very real. I mean, you know, you've had if if one actually looks at it over the years, you've had multiple careers that have prepared you for what you needed to do next, but also multiple experiences that have prepared you for what you needed to do next because you know as a as a black woman who has watched that series and certainly when i saw the first episode which and i'm getting chills right now um that showed benin um and i am i am afro-caribbean um when i saw what you when you showed benin i saw haiti i i you know i've been there I saw Haiti. That's what I saw, you know, and I was watching it with my sister and and texting others and texting you and I was in tears um, because it speaks to what you're talking about this, you know, the reflexive thought that there is a deficiency that needs to be corrected rather than a community that has been deliberately under-resourced um, and, and quite frankly, stolen from for centuries to the point where that history, the, literally the history was stolen. I thought it was a very powerful moment in when you went to Gonvier because there's this narrative that we didn't resist. And what you've shown is that we resisted in every possible way we could. And, you know, from Gonvier, um, if you haven't seen it, you know, um, chills, you know, and, and that we can survive almost anywhere. Um, to that moment where you broke down in tears. Um, do you feel comfortable about speaking about that particular moment? I'm happy to speak with you about it. Um, I mean, first of all, I should I should just name um, Karis Jagger and Fabian Tobek, who are the executive producers of High on the Hog, who are the visionaries of High on the Hog, who absorb this essential text from many of our collective mentor and, and hero, Dr. J, Dr. Jessica B. Harris, you know, um, is a Fabian who really was so moved by these stories, which were purposely obfuscated and stolen. Like we're talking about theft. Again, right. we have we have to understand story and power as synonymous. And so, 
historical erasure is a flex. It is intentional. It is a way to gain ground and suppress. And Fabian and Karis were so moved by that absence and the need to correct that historical record that they pursued taking this, bringing this show to the masses by way of the Netflix docuseries. So they need to be celebrated for their vision. Uh -huh. um, same for director um, Roger Ross Williams, whose vision as a direct allowed for, for the space necessary for these stories to come through in the way that they needed to come through. And Shoshana Guy, the showrunner, who I trusted so deeply um, with that presence, care, attention, Black feminine care, and presence, and attention allows for spaces of vulnerability, right? right? Um, and so, and of course, the presence of, of, of Dr. J, who has been one of the most singularly important people in my life, even way before this opportunity came up, right? And, and if you look at her text and what she, even though she doesn't always call it this, but like food anthropology, how she has um, placed Blackness and placed the African diaspora in the center of her scholarship, in the center of, of culinary um, research from a historical context, giving it the t attention that we give other cuisines, European cuisines, in which you go to a culinary school and just learn French food. And, and dare I say it, if I may, um, because I had this remark, um, I think when I was probably around um, episode three, um, when, you know, when you expanded the scope outside of the South up to the Northeast, um, my thought was, and forgive me, is that arguably West African cuisine has actually had the most impact and influence on the world when you consider that it's the foundational foundation of American cuisine um, and also South American cuisine. And also um, you find it in Central American cuisine and Caribbean cuisine. Um, and then of course the Africa itself and um, you know, throughout Europe that arguably that West Africans have influenced the world's cuisine in a way that is almost immeasurable. Um, and that, I felt that communicated to me um, mm -hmm. as I watched each episode. But, you know, there's a certain structure and I wanted to ask you about the deliberation of the structure, like how that came to be. What, what is the story um, that you wanted to tell? with these particular vignettes? Um, you mean on the, high on the hog? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, again, I have to just really fall back in that genre, because that whole arena, because um, I was asked to host this show. And um, it, that is and always will be such an immense honor for me, right? So in terms of how I, I tried to show up. And I, I think what I was asked to do is to just kind of hold space for the viewer to be a conduit, to be a vessel, to be present, um, but not a distraction. And so like all the talent that you see, um, the storytelling, the arcs, these historical connections in contemporary contexts, like, I cannot take credit for that. Um, and I cannot overstate that too, because people are thanking me for, for make, actualizing this work. And I'm like, I'm just a small part of, and I know, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be like cute and humble. I really mean it. Like this, I was asked to do this, that is an honor. Um, but this was a massive collective vision. Um, and so all I did was, was to hold that space um, and in terms of like how the, the vignettes were selected, um, prioritized and, and actualized, I, I have to, again, just name the EPs, the showrunner and the director. And I think it, it matters that, you know, Black people were a, an integral part, not just in the story, but around the story, the framing of the story. And I think, you know, 
because you are already a storyteller, um, because you're already a person that archives um, this kind of information, um, what I saw as a viewer and, you know, certainly what I felt as you being a conduit was the awe that you were experiencing because there's things that we just know, right? There's a lot that some of us, especially if we work in food, we know certain things we know, but to be a part of it and have all that is the, that is the sense that, you know, that's what brought me in because it's not, I've certainly seen other versions of black food stories, um, like depicted, I think, you know, it matters. Um, that a person who is a descendant of slavery is the person that those stories are coming through. Um, I think it doesn't work as well in other ways um, because then it becomes, at least for me, um, you know, you become an observer and like you are part of the story. And they tell you never become part of the story, but in food, I think you need to be part of the story. Everything you're saying so deeply. Um, I feel it so deeply. I mean, basically, so in talking about me accepting this this role, right? That contingency for me was like, who are the other folks on this team who are going to be handling Dr. J's work? Mm -hmm. Like, and I was told and saw that it was an all black team, even down to um, you know, in the DP, the director of photography, who was a, a black man, Jerry Henry, who um, all of the beautiful B-roll that y'all saw from, from Africa, from Benin, I mean, this brother was like, you know, holding the camera, like running in between, ducking and weaving in, in the market um, with the dancing vignettes, like so emo so invested in this work you know and what happens is again because it's a power dynamic what happens is off of black culture right it's not cool to allow black people to profit off of black culture word it's not cool to let black people have agency in telling their stories because that agency requires a transfer of power and that's not cool for folks who are holding power which is based on a racialized system that we're now in in the fifth century of trying to move through right so i i feel like you know i that awe that curiosity that's real for me mm -hmm. that is that is what drives my work i still am moved by these global origin stories. I'm still moved by the ways in which conversations between diaspora and descendant can shift our entire relationship to the world and that can shift culture. You know, I'm interested in shifting culture. I'm interested in using food as a means of shifting culture. And I believe the means of using food to do that is connecting people to these historical identities because that is, that is a source of pride and power. Pride is something that subjugated classes and races don't feel enough of. But that's part of how stories are hijacked right. to diminish value. This is the stories that not only white folks tell about us and our worth and our capability and capacity, as you alluded to earlier, but then sometimes we absorb these own, our own anti-Black stories. You feel me? And so now it's like, how do we move through this? We need a whole narrative transformation. And I know it feels like out there and esoteric for people, but to me it's like core, it's fundamental because that's the foundation that our society and our work and our identities are, are built on, you know? But I think that food is um, obviously an opportunity to kind of, um, hijack what seems so esoteric because everybody's interested in food you know whatever aspect that is we all need to eat and we all have sense memories um, but when you were talking about how even 
um, marginalized people have feel a certain way about their food. Um, you know, uh, there's a whole, you know, internet outrage about a black food writer writing a watermelon recipe. Excuse me. I'm so glad you, I'm so glad you said this. <laughs> like, like actually that, honestly, it really hurts me. It hurts my heart, you know, honestly it does because it's very nuanced as well. Like there's a lot going on with, with that situation. Um, first and foremost, Nicole Taylor is supposed to have been a household name, right? So, so we wouldn't even be going through this if, if the proper appreciation, again, this goes back to like, I, I mean, you, you know, everything that's been said, right? So Nicole Taylor is supposed to have been a household name in which that would have never happened, Right. first of all. Second of all, what people are responding to is the fact that for a lot of folks who aren't in the industry, who aren't paying close attention, it feels divergent. Right. It's like, hold on, y'all doing what now? We're talking about what? Because there's no precedent. That's not what the brand was built on. Right. And so, and there's no kind of, uh, formalization of the shift right? and so in a sense that's also what people are responding to the the consumers the relationship with folks that you go for those and develop is in a sense a reflection of the brand right so for instance, if that same image lands on whetstone's page do we see the same response i don't right. know but at least there has been a precedent of talking about this this type of work, right? So that's the second thing. And then the the other thing though, which actually just just hurts me, but also um, propels me to want to do more work is that we're missing that reclamation piece. Right, right. Right, like this watermelon thing to say that we are perpetuating stereotypes when it's our work, it's our history, it's our labor, it's our scholarship. We have allowed, understandably, and also due to power and pervasiveness of stories, watermelon to become a bad word for our, our community. I don't know about that. I love watermelon. I'm not giving that Delicious. up for, for white I'll, people. I'll eat it in public. I don't care. And I'm definitely <laughs> not giving it up for other Black people. Word. What, are we, what are we doing? We need to be looking up Nicole Taylor's scholarship. The folks in the comment is like, she got a Juneteenth. She's literally writing the book on this. What are we doing with that? You know, so it's a, it's a lot going on in that situation. Um, but if there's anyone watching this who... Um, felt like that was out of pocket. It wasn't, okay? And also, I encourage y'all to go all the way back. I'm talking about back, 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 15, 20 years, and check out Nicole's body of work instead of looking for an opportunity to pile on to a Black woman who's been in this work. Right? And also, like, don't seed these narratives without knowing your history. Right. That is giving power unnecessarily. So, yeah, that is, I'm glad you mentioned it because that's been on my, on my mind. I was, I, that situation threw me off, but um, there's a lot going on with it and um, we should all be uplifting Nicole Taylor every opportunity we get. Exactly. And I think that, you know, this idea, not just of reclamation, but of, of actually informing people, it works really well in the, such a visual medium, medium. Um, you know, when you went to bed um, and enjoyed oysters, like, you know, the current people do not associate blackness and oysters, including black people, you know, black people like this is gross, you know? And I think what happens with food people is that we only really seem to hang out with other food people. Um, and so, you know, you've taken an opportunity to be able to kind of be the bridge between the food people and the people, 
Um, and, you know, because you brought such vulnerability to that space and reverence that comes from being a food person, all of that becomes so much more accessible um, to the average person, you know, um, because, you know, you read a lot of, you read food magazines and, and they, you know, either come in very like, this is for housewives, this one is for scholars, like, and this kind of meets in the middle of all of those places. And, and that's the anthropological piece of all of this. So what did you find out that you didn't know before? when participating in this docu-series? Mm. There's so much I didn't know. I mean, I knew, um, I knew about what I read, um, but I learned that reading is completely inadequate for experience and for the, the reverence, as you say, that you can't help but feel when you are in the company, in the presence of the folks who really have been doing this work. And, and for me, that was just so humbling because um, I, I mean, even though I have this kind of origin um, framework in my work that permeates my work, um, it is in a sense global and it's all over the place. And there's a lot of different facets to it. There's a lot of different mediums. But like we're talking about people who just for generations hold down these stories. Again, the stakes are raised on that when we recognize that in the absence of these folks, like the Brunos who I just put on my IG account from Texas, like if we lose the context of Juneteenth as a black Texas thing. Right. Right? Like we, that attribution has to be there, even for us as a people, right? And so I think that that it really has deepened my conviction around the power of of food and identity, and and how much can be learned when um, you can be in in the environment and in the presence of folks who really have been guarding and holding and protecting culture um, and legacy. And, you know, you were talking about like the oyster thing in, in bed side. And part of what I'm trying to, to promote with this work is that black folks, the dominance of our influence is everywhere on everything. And when we say like, that's not black, that's not for us. Like that is so not only like an insult to the ancestors, but like, historically and provably just false, you know? And so like when we absorb stories, we don't know the origins, possibly absorbing stories from folks who are in the ruling class of power about what is and is not for us. You know, we could, like this, like we should be celebrating a new generation of, of, of entrepreneurship, a reclamation of oysters happening by black uh, entrepreneur in New York, right? So, and like, I mean, you heard the whole story around the cowboys, even the word, the language, right? Like reclamation is important. And um, I, I really think that um, folks gotta understand our relationship to the world in relationship to this historical and origin framework, right? For the right humility and for the right orientation to build new futures going forward, which we're trying to build a new future where this anti-Black racism isn't at the center of everything. Word. I think, you know, it came to mind when you were speaking, like you will know a people um, through their food. And this idea that many of us have on this side that, you know, we just cooked the food and, and we didn't create the food or just appeared or you know we don't have um links to other things or and when you discover or re recognize that that food is as broad and varied and diverse as the people themselves it makes your world view shift you know from i would think global to even a cosmic level um and that's how I felt. And, and I know certainly, you know, 
our respective ancestors had access to less um, than we do now and did so much more yeah. with it. I, I, I really felt that with the, um, with the cowboys, um, especially when I started talking about the oxtail because yeah. I you know, have feelings about how the price of oxtail now um but that you know and, it, and we hear it all the time but it, it still resonates powerfully with me to hear that you know they gave us the scraps and we transformed them and i think that is happening in this modern day and age you know um we get the scraps transform them and all of a sudden everybody wants to be a part of it I love the photo. look at that <laughs> So let's talk about um, the Radio Collective. Um, you know, I know that it's um, it's it's a it's a work in progress um, in terms of the crowdfunding. Um, but I suspect that you already have some things already in place um, to share with us. And if they're not too big of a, if you wouldn't mind. I don't mind. Um, we're out, we're out here now. We're on Maine. We've announced our plans um, with with this new venture. Um, I mean, I love podcasts. I just want to say that you know, I am a lover of the medium. I find it to be um, one of the most intimate means of of storytelling. And um, as much as I, you know, love and do this show. I think that audio is the right amount of engagement for me as the consumer because I don't really know what you look like. I don't really know where you are, but I, I have to engage with the material um, to be present in the story. And so uh, it makes passive engagement more difficult, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and also just looking at podcasts broadly, um, most of what you're getting is, um, which is, again, nothing wrong with this because I'm listening to these types of podcasts all day long, but it's like host, maybe two hosts, guest, we have a chat about something. Um, at the foundation of everything to me and, and story is like, it's all helpful, right? And that, that aesthetic and that care has to be present in stories in order for it to make an emotional impact on people because again we're trying to change culture and so what the promise is of this this new network and why i'm trying to raise funds for it is because it allows us to from the beginning put a new vision around how to make podcasts right um or how these stories are being told and give the same luxurious care attention that we give um you know like all of our our stories with the magazine um and turning and and moving some of those things that i've personally learned as a as a storyteller um from that experience and now creating a new venture with folks who have um specialized skills in podcasting um to really bring stories from all over the world. So we'll have a show from Taiwan. We have a show from India. We have a show um, um, from like all of everything, but from Mexico about Mezcal. We have a, a fruits um, kind of origin show. Um, so the material is going to kind of reflect this global gastronomy thing that I've been on my, my whole life. Um, but the thing that I'm hype about is the way that folks will absorb the stories on this new network, I mm -hmm. think is going to be um, completely original. And that's the part that I'm excited to build. Well, then, so then my next question is, how can people um, support the, the crowdfunding? Where should they go? Um, yeah. You know, and um, what else can they do? Like, oh. what, what oh. do we need to... Call to action. Let's do it. Let's all do yes. it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, uh, we we're we're asking that folks um, su support via Indiegogo, which is a crowdfunding campaign um, or platform, I should say. Um, so you can go on Whetstone's Instagram um, and see the whole video that I'm presenting and talking about the network. 
um, you can go straight to Indiegogo um, and go to Whetstone Radio Collective. Um, we have all kinds of prizes, um, all kinds of prizes, you know, um, incentives. But the main incentive is, that I'm trying to build on a community level is um, asking you to help me actualize this new platform, um, which we think has the potential to be massively transformative. Um, and uh, I know that there's so many um, like really amazing people out there telling our stories and and um, it's it's almost it's really hard to name um, them, but um, you know, what are you reading right now and learning from right now and consuming right now? Oh, there's so much out there. This is a good time. Um, who have I been reading a lot? Um, I've been reading like. I just know some folks who I, I feel because there's so there's a lot I've been reading, but I just want to name some names of folks who are really influencing my thinking. Um, Dr. Monica Wright um, or White, I'm sorry, um, Ashante Reese of Freedom Farmers, um, Ashante Reese, um, Hannah Garth, um, of course, Dr. J, Nicole Taylor, who has been mentioned. Um, always appreciate. Toon Day's um, Instagram, Ruminations, um, the brother um, Omar Tate's uh, incredible poet. Um, I think Gabrielle had a new um, uh, short film drop today, Gabrielle Etienne, the brother uh -huh. Michael Twitty and his ongoing scholarship with Rice, like um, Leah Penniman, Soul Fire Farm. Like there, I, there's so much out there right now for us um, in terms of the blueprint and um, material to organize around and galvanize around. Um, and so I'm just inspired by all that. And I hope this new platform actually allows us um, even even broader amplification for a, a lot of those folks' work. Thank you. And, and you know, I, I'm so looking forward to your next steps. It's, you know, every single one, I feel, um, you know, that my understanding expands a little bit more and my heart warms a lot more um and i would be remiss if i didn't mention um my friend our mutual friend mr clay williams um yeah. <laughs> who brought us together and and um you know is a storyteller in his own right through his photography um so i want to thank you i want to thank whetstone magazine um i want to thank you the audience for your um, patience and tolerance during the technical difficulties um, and, you know, Steve and I look so much forward to talking to you again and, and consuming more of your, your stories and, and the awe, you know, that is like food culture. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. It's such a pleasure to be here with you and um, salute to you and all your work as well. So thank you. Thank you. Okay.